Hello, and welcome to the Renaissance English History Podcast, a part of the Agora Podcast Network. I'm your host, Heather Tesco, and I'm a storyteller who makes history accessible because I believe it's a pathway to understanding who we are, our place in the universe, and being more deeply in touch with our own humanity. This is episode 163, and it's a special one on women pirates. Shiver timbers! Army meaty. Because this week, two very special weeks, days are coming together. First, it's Women's History Month, and we're coming up to International Women's Day. And I'm a woman, so this is important to me. Second, this week in 1496, John Cabot, who was actually the Italian Giovanni Cabotto, received letters patent from Henry VII to explore Newfoundland, which, of course, was the nascent beginning of the Age of Exploration in England, which would reach its full culmination a hundred years later under Elizabeth. So I decided to mix the two and do this episode on women pirates. It also kind of fits the recent episode I did on sea shanties too. So we're kind of seeing a pattern emerge, which is basically that I have itchy feet and want to get on a boat somewhere, I guess, anywhere, maybe. But first, a little admin. You guys, it's been a long time since I've done a patron shout out and I need to do a patron shout out because... My patrons are awesome. My patrons are the best patrons. So thank you to Bex, Taylor, Heather, Juliet, Shamala. I love your name, Shamala. Marie, Cheyenne, Sharon, Joelle, Nina, Kimberly, Joanna, Tracy, Alexandra, Justine, Rachel, Paul, Vivian, Jennifer, another Jennifer, Jennifer M and Jennifer H. Jill, Sharon, Michael, Babette, Delia, John, Katie, Kimberly, Helen, Wendy, Jim, Vicky, Donna, Kara, Sarah, another John, Susan, Selene, Andrea, Catherine, Ian, Shar, Kendra, Kendra, whose name I spelled wrong in her TutorCon 2019 name badge, Joanne, Kathy, Another Kathy, Kathy with a Y, Kathy with an I, Rebecca from Tudor's Dynasty, Al, Shandor, and Jurgen. That's my daddy. (laughs) Thank you to my amazing patrons. If you want to support this podcast through Patreon and pledge your support, you can do that at patreon.com slash englandcast. That's patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash englandcast. Okay, women pirates. So it wasn't very long after the first sailors sailed into the waters that pirates followed, hoping for riches and adventure. And we might have a very specific idea when we think about pirates. My daughter right now is in love with all things related to Peter Pan. So we see a lot of pirate depictions, and there's the eye patch and the peg leg and the parrot. And the pirates we see are pretty much always men. For a long time, sailors would actually sign a contract prohibiting women from even being on board. But women, creative geniuses that we are, would find ways around this, often dressing as men to sneak on board. From the ancient Mediterranean period through the Middle Ages, we see a handful of women leading ships. Sometimes they pretended to be men, other times they took control completely on their own. Usually this was if they were related to another sea captain or pirate. Maybe it was a husband and they took over after he died. The Norse sagas tell stories of warrior princesses sailing to America even and fighting sea battles. And in the show notes, which I will put up at englandcast.com slash women pirates, I will add a book list where you can dig deeper into women pirates of all periods if that strikes your fancy. But for the purposes of this podcast, we're going to talk about three extraordinary women who sailed the high seas or directed piracy operations in the 16th century. In Ireland, there is a museum to Grace O'Malley, the only museum in the world dedicated to a female mariner. Now, some of you who are Irish might catch me up on the fact that I'm using Grace's name in the anglicized version and not the traditional Irish, which is how she would have known herself. I say her name this way for two reasons. First, she doesn't appear in Irish records, so everything we know about her comes from England. And second, I can't actually pronounce her name in the original Celtic, and I'm not even going to try. 
But I want to be clear that Grace O'Malley is a name that's given to her. It's not the name that she knew herself as. Again, in the show notes, I'll have documents with her Irish name as it should have been, and you can try to pronounce it. A few years ago, I did an episode on the English relationship with Ireland, and I'll link to that in the show notes too. But for those of you who need a refresher, Ireland at this point was ruled by a lot of small bands. England was doing its best to bring it under English control in the form of a centralized government based out of Dublin. By the late 16th century, English nobles were building colonies in Ireland to try to take it over and anglicize it. One of the leading families in Ireland was the O'Malley's. They were seafarers. And the legends say that Grace's father was a prominent sailor by 1530 when she was born. Some stories say that she had a brother who didn't want to sail. And so she took over her father's business. Much of what we know about her is legend. But like so many legends, there's likely a bit of truth underneath it somewhere, if only to show her character. So, for example, one early story about her life says that when she was young, there was a group of eagles terrorizing the animals on her land. And to save the livestock, the young Grace ran into the eagles and attacked them, despite the fact that most of them were much bigger than she was. Apparently, this fight with the eagles left her with scars on her forehead that she had for the rest of her life. The head of the family was known simply by his surname, O'Malley. Local folklore had it that when Grace was a young girl, she wanted to go on a trading expedition to Spain with her father. She was told that she couldn't go because she was a girl and that her long hair would catch in the ship's ropes. So she actually cut off most of her hair to embarrass her father into taking her or alternatively to sneak on board. And she became known then as Bald Grace. Grace was educated, something that we know because later in her story, when she met Queen Elizabeth, she spoke Latin with her. She married a fellow called Donal of Flattery, heir to the powerful clan nearby. It was a political marriage. They had two sons and a daughter. And while Donal was the head of the family, he spent much of his time off making war and fighting. So Grace was often left helping to take care of the inhabitants nearby. Donald was killed in a battle in 1565, and Grace vowed to take revenge on the clan that killed him. It was a blood feud. She herself took the castle that Donald had been fighting for, and then when it was clear that she wouldn't inherit the chieftain and would be expected to become a meek widow, she left. She returned home to Clare Island with a group of her husband's men who were still loyal to her. Her leadership grew, and she wound up with a band of around 200 people. She took her father's ships, and she launched a career on the high seas. She was in her late 30s by this point, so, you know, it's never too old to to start a new career. She sailed in galley ships with oars on a single sail similar to a Viking longship. She knew the Irish coast like the back of her hand, and she would sail in these very maneuverable ships, She would sail around preying on trading ships coming across. She would take what she wanted, and then she would escape into the small islands and coves along the western Irish coast, where no one would be able to follow her or find her. She married a second time a man called Richard Burke. He had a fleet of trading ships and a fortress called Rockfleet Castle. They had a good working relationship, and they had one son. In 1576, an English representative visited their home and Grace pledged her support on behalf of the family. The fact that she did this on behalf of her husband, promising that he would do as she asked him to, led the English to say that she was a notorious woman in all the coasts of Ireland. Sir Henry Sidney knighted Richard before leaving home, and this made Grace Lady Burke. She supposedly gave birth to their son while she was sailing with Richard, and the day after he was born, the ship was attacked by Algerian corsairs. Her men couldn't fight them off. Grace was resting and recovering below from childbirth, which had happened the day before. But she comes up cursing, May you be seven times worse in one year, seeing you can't manage for even one day without me. And she joins in the battle. The corsairs were so surprised by this woman, looking as if she'd just had a baby because she had, coming up, that it supposedly turned the tide and they won. You can imagine she wanted some serious R&R time after that, though, right? 
She was first captured in 1577 by the Earl of Desmond while she was raiding on his land, and she was sent to Dublin Castle, where she was kept in jail for 18 months. This woman is in her late 40s by this point, right? You guys, this is just kind of amazing. She was released in a bargain to stop her husband rebelling, and then she resumed her piracy nearly 50 years old at this point. The English grew to hate Grace. She stood for everything that the English wanted to subdue in Ireland, and she refused to become this submissive subject. Though the local chieftains respected her and they did their best to keep her safe, but the English eventually kidnapped two of her sons. One of them died in English custody. So Grace took her case to a female queen, Elizabeth herself. In 1593, she wrote to Elizabeth asking that her other son be released. She was honest about her past, she admitted to her piracy, but she said that it had been necessary for her in order to feed her family and her people. She promised that if Elizabeth would grant them the right to hold their lands under English law, she would devote herself to sailing against Elizabeth's enemies and would answer to Elizabeth directly. Elizabeth found this all very intriguing. She loved the idea of this pirate queen writing to her. She sent questions back to Grace for Grace to answer, and Grace wrote back her answers. She painted a picture of herself as a smart woman. She compared herself to Queen Elizabeth herself. She actually set sail to England with the answers, hoping to meet Elizabeth in person. She wasn't going to trust this to a messenger. This was a really bold move, not just because she was a woman, but also because she was a well-known pirate, and England's ports were filled with bodies of hanged pirates and criminals. But she wanted her son back. By this point, he had been charged with treason, and she knew that if she didn't take action quickly, he would be killed. Grace and Elizabeth met in the autumn of 1593. We don't have an exact recounting of the meeting, but there are plenty of stories about what they wore, who was taller, and apparently one of Elizabeth's ladies offered Grace a lace handkerchief. Grace blew her nose on it and then threw it into the fire, much to the horror of the said lady. The lace was apparently quite expensive. You can just imagine these two women meeting and having this amazing conversation, both of them very intelligent and bold and taking on roles that were very different than what the world expected of their sex. Grace was eventually allowed to return home and her son was freed and she resumed living her life of piracy with Elizabeth's blessings. And in fact, the story ends with the English being required to give Grace a pension, much to their outrage. Guys, this is a quick ad break for the Intelligent Speech Conference. Intelligent Speech is an online conference dedicated to connecting the best independent educational content creators with their listeners. And I am thrilled and honored that I am going to be part of Intelligent Speech again. This year's conference takes place on April the 24th, 10 a.m. Eastern, 3 p.m. London, 4 p.m. Europe. I, Heather Tesco, will be appearing alongside David Crowther of the History of England. Can I tell you how much it gives me goosebumps to say that? Liz Covart of Ben Franklin's World, Roger Lynch of What If Alternative History, and about 40 other great content creators. There's going to be 24 hours of content in four simultaneous streams. There will be so much to discover. You can interact with your favorite show hosts and fellow fans in an immersive conference experience. Tickets are $30. They're $20 right now as an early bird special. But wait, there's more. Um, If you use the word TUDOR when you check out, T-U-D-O-R, Enter that code and you'll save an additional 10%. So go to intelligentspeechconference.com slash shop. That's intelligentspeechconference.com slash shop to get your ticket and enter the code TUTOR when you sign up to get a 10% discount. Now here's a super fun trailer that they put together for the conference and then we'll get back to another pirate story. By any means necessary. When Napoleon laid Boulogne for a year. Zachary Davis. Jane Redfin. Benjamin Jacobs. I'm Eric Marcus. Dan McManamy. Cyanide. Free. Rudyard Lynch. Susan Archery. Alex Clifford. B.T. Newberg. Raven Forrest Ruscalzo. Stephen Guerra. Elsa and Chris. David Crowther. And I, Liz Covard, will be speaking alongside 40 other great content creators. 10, 9. 
This will be an event that you don't want to miss. Intelligent Speech is back. Intelligent Speech is an online conference dedicated to connecting the best independent educational content creators with their listeners. This year's Intelligent Speech Conference will be held on Saturday, April 24th, starting at 10 a.m. Eastern Time, or for our friends across the Atlantic, 3 p.m. London Time. Tickets will be $30, but are available for only $20 as an early bird special. You can get them online at intelligentspeechconference.com slash shop. The other story I want to tell you about is a mother-in-law and daughter-in-law, Mary and Elizabeth Killigrew, part of a pirating operation run out of Cornwall. One thing about Mary and Elizabeth is that there's a lot of uncertainty about whose role was what in this operation, and some historians actually combine them into one person. But if it was just one person, they lived a really, really long time. And it seems that the daughter-in-law, Mary, was responsible for many of the more daring parts of this story. Elizabeth Killigrew was the mother of Sir John Killigrew. He was the vice admiral of Cornwall. He was a blood relative to William Cecil. He was also a pirate. The family basically ran the piracy racket out of Cornwall. They didn't always go out on the raids themselves, but they had the ships, they bribed the officials, they handled the payment disputes with crews, they assessed the stolen goods, they managed to give the crown their share of the stolen goods, and they were really, really successful pirates for the queen. Elizabeth was walking a fine line at this point because she officially didn't want to have pirates in her kingdom, but she made a lot of money from her sea dogs. That was what they were called, right? So she kind of had to walk this middle line. Now, Mary Wolverston was the daughter of a gentleman pirate called Philip Wolverston, and Mary married Elizabeth's son, John, after her first husband died. John had duties that necessitated a lot of travel. Like I said, he was the vice admiral of Cornwall. He was also the royal governor of one of the fortresses built by Henry VIII nearby. While he was away, Mary went out and did some pirating, preferring to be hands-on with the operation. They hid the stolen goods in their home. They paid officials not to see them. Working for this family was a good gig. The crews knew they'd be taken care of. Mary and Elizabeth would actually cook family meals for them sometimes and serve them in their main home. If a pirate was being followed by an official, he would sail right to their home and know that Sir John would row out and offer the official a lovely vacation, hunting on their land for a few days, in return for him looking the other way. This racket lasted for decades, and they had pretty much all of the Cornish officials in their pockets. But it was Mary who supposedly brought them down around 1582 when a Hanseatic ship sailed into the Falmouth Harbor right to their home. The weather was really bad. They were forced to anchor and send two men ashore asking for shelter. The two men explained their situation to the lady of the house, Mary, who served them food and explained that the ship would be safe in the harbor and they should ride out the storm as a guest in Penryn, which was nearby. The sailors knew that England and the Hanseatic League were at peace, and they agreed that this was a good offer. So they go off to this guest house. The boat is in harbor. Everything seems like it's good. But as soon as they left, Lady Mary looked at the ship, and she decided that she wanted it. She was almost 60 years old at this point, but she still commanded a following. She gathered a crew, including servants, and she sailed out to the ship that night, covering the oars with pieces of cloth to keep it quiet. They climbed aboard the ship, they killed any remaining crew that they found, and they took all the treasure that they wanted into the boats that they had sailed out on. Supposedly, some of the Killigrew pirates took control of the ship and sailed it to Ireland. When the gentleman who had stayed in the guest house returned and looked out at the harbor... Their ship was gone, and there was nothing there. The two men lodged a complaint with the Commission for Piracy in Cornwall, which conveniently was run by Lady Mary's son. The commission, surprisingly, was unable to find anything wrong or discover who committed the act. But the captains pursued their claim. They took it higher and higher until it reached the desk of Elizabeth herself. Now Elizabeth was in a muddle. She couldn't ignore the evidence that Mary was at fault here. She didn't want to make things difficult with the Hanseatic League. 
But she also didn't want to lose the Killigrews because she was making a lot of money off of them. So Lady Mary and her servants went on trial for piracy, and they were all found guilty and sentenced to death. But Lady Mary was given a reprieve. Some say that it was her husband who secured the release, but others say that it was Elizabeth herself who pardoned her. And the Killigrews would stay on being pirates for Elizabeth for the foreseeable future. So that's it for this week. The book recommendation is Pirate Women, the Princesses, Prostitutes, and Privateers Who Ruled the Seven Seas by Laura Sook Duncombe. I'll have a link to buy it in the show notes at englandcast.com slash womenpirates. And I'll also have a further reading list there as well. Let me know what you thought about this episode. You can get in touch with me through the listener support line at 8016-TESCO, 801-683-9756, I believe it is. Or you can join the new Tudor Learning Circle, which is a free social network just for Tudor history nerds. Thank you so much for listening, and I will be back in a couple of weeks. Bye-bye. Blow, northern wind, ascend, who may be sweating. Blow, northern wind, blow, 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 ich hote, blow.